Hi, my name is Ivy Winfrey, and I am your host of the Afro Ballers podcast. We focus on the intersection of sports, Africa, and the diaspora, and we are so very excited to be here in Paris at the 2024 Summer Olympics in partnership with FIBA, coming to you live from the FIBA house. So listen, the Afro Ballers podcast is a unique platform that focuses on sharing stories from celebrities, athletes, influencers alike, and we focus on the issues that are important to the community, the diaspora, and the greater um, creative community. And so, our first guest, our inaugural guest, is Todd Ramsar, who is a former basketball player, a basketball agent, a father. He is based in Los Angeles, but his reach extends far, far beyond that. He's the agent of the 2019 NBA champion and all-star guard, Pascal Siakam. Todd, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Ivy. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. You it know, any reason Paris. to be in Paris, right? Oh, with weather like this? <laughs> you kidding me? Where would you rather be? Exactly, you nowhere. Know? I right love here. that. I love that. So listen, you have experienced a multitude of success, right? Whether from the player standpoint to the agent standpoint. But it's always incredible to hear your story from the perspective of you. So what drove you to go from becoming a basketball player at a very young age, mm -hmm. at the ripe age of 22, 23, and becoming the first youngest certified MBPA agent and start your own agency? Well, Ivy, it actually takes me back to college at UCLA. I actually started in the business when I was 19. It was the end of my sophomore year. Started working for uh, Arn Tellum, it was an internship. And a lot of my teammates were actually signing with Arn in the agency. And for those who don't know Arn, Arn had the pleasure of representing somebody who we love and is near and dear, a great member of the basketball community who is the late, great Kobe Bryant. No question. Yes. Kobe among, amongst uh, Tracy McGrady, Jermaine O'Neal, uh, Baron Davis, a former client and, uh, and teammate of mine. At the time, I think he represented about 12% of the NBA. Wow. But um, it was a special time being in that office because Bob Myers was there as an agent, Rob Palenka, Warren Laguerre. That was just a breeding ground, apparently, for, for future NBA executives. Oh, no question. <laughs> no question. And that's just to name a few. Yes. There were several more. But, you know, my entry point into that is I knew I wasn't going to play in the NBA. I knew I was going uh, to go to law school. So that was a way for me to stay close to the business and still stay attached to the NBA. And uh, I was always in the business I guess you could say in terms of uh, being in service to others. So I like being involved in business, but I also like being in service uh, to some of my former teammates in terms of helping them navigate their careers and uh, set themselves up for success later in life. And that's that's a very interesting segue because I remember reading that at that point, yes, you were still very young, still finishing your formal education. And so, for example, between you and BD, y'all just kind of figured it out. If you needed an attorney, you went and sourced an attorney, right? If you needed a CPA, you went um, and sourced a CPA. How do you think that kind of diving head first into that space allows you to learn on the job, so to speak? I was gonna say experience is the best teacher, mm -hmm. but when you have mentors and people that have found success, at least for us, older people that have found success even outside of the realm of sports, let's just say in entertainment. So it wasn't just about sourcing just any accountant or sourcing, sourcing any lawyer. It's even the approach I take now is like seeking the best of the best in their field. So, you know, by being that kind of conduit or that, you know, quarterbacking that for the clients in terms of getting them the best resources or service providers, that's done well for them and set them up, like I said, as I mentioned, for the future. For certainly. Now, listen, you've enjoyed a lengthy career, which, you know, in this business, one knows that every day, every month, every week, every right. year that you still get to work in the business is a blessing because it's very much a business that changes very rapidly. So in retrospect, what do you think has changed now for players in terms of the representation side and how has that altered the landscape of the league? Yeah, so the players have gotten a lot more sophisticated over the years. Um, and sophisticated from the standpoint of, at least for the uh, NBA players, there was also always almost more so a domestic focus, uh, but now it's global, right? And we could go and point to, you know, the Michael Jordans of the world and those elite athletes, but you're seeing that kind of filter to all athletes now that are, you know, getting outside of their comfort zone and, and going into, um, you know, global markets, 
uh, private equity, uh, different types of investments, and this is even outside of their marketing portfolio. How I've seen that change or see the league evolve is NBA teams now and the NBA itself and even the PA have to extend a lot more resources to support the athletes. And that could show up in different forms. Uh, the MBPA does their programs uh, internationally, whether it be in Milan or other places to expose athletes that may have an interest in fashion, fashion right? Likes, right? But if it's from an NBA team standpoint, a lot of that might be expanding their medical staff, player engagement, community relations. And that wasn't there 20 years ago, at least not at the extent that it is now. Right. So you're seeing that evolution. And then, of course, you know, everyone's pointing to the new media rights deal, which is, is, gonna, is going to benefit the players. It's been a blockbuster deal to say the yeah. least, right? Yeah, and, and, and kudos to the NBA for having that in their foresight years ago and actually accomplishing that mission in terms of what that target is. But that's also going to benefit the players. And in a, lot, in a lot of ways, financially for them, now it takes them into the realm of starting their own family offices where you know you see it with Steph, you see it with LeBron, you see it with a lot of these players, but these contract values now, I think are going to extend not just to your 1% of the NBA, but you know- Triple down effect, so to no speak. No question. So right, right. just because the level of these contracts. So right. you're gonna see more and more players, I think, where we may be the quarterback or I may be the quarterback as an agent initially, you're gonna see the players as they evolve and grow start to add other pieces independent of the agent or agency to support their own personal enterprise. Two very much, two things that I'd like to point out there. I was gonna ask, first and foremost, do you think that because of the involvement from a business decision-making standpoint, contract negotiation, I know mm. we see all the stories of the GM and the likes, but do you think that because the, power, the these players now are not only very well versed um, in their value and their power, that that has disrupted the agent ecosystem at all? It depends on what perspective you're looking at it. For me, I'm an educator okay. for my clients. I want to empower them. So it's a partnership in, it, of no, sorts. No question. Yes. Because, you know, unless you're a family that has multiple children that are playing in the NBA or WNBA, you don't know what you don't know, even as, and it's not a matter of intellect, right. it's just a matter of knowing how to navigate But the to waters. your point, experience, the yeah, experience. experience. Right. So they're, you know, getting a client in their inception into the league is much different than getting a client 10 years into 10 the league. years later. Right, or even five years. Right. So in terms of having that experience for them, yes, it, it you know, has it changed the dynamic between, you know, how agents approach the business? Certainly. Yeah, yeah. but again, if you're educating and empower, empowering your athletes, you want them to grow and evolve over their career so that if they do add someone independent of the agency, it's not a threat. It's more um, adding pieces to the ecosystem, which is that of the athlete 1, and their business and enterprise. The other point that I wanted to point out to your point is that teams are now having to supplement their ecosystems to support players as they grow in their investments, their interests and the likes. I've always been of the notion that the teams of the future are almost going to have what is reminiscent of an in-house agency mm -hmm. that works in their interest, but works in tandem with the teams that um, the players then assemble to make sure that everybody's interests are met and are heightened at, at, or are, are maximized, should I right. say. Is that, would you, would you ratify that? Would you say that that is correct? I would like? say that's happening now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think as you point to the future, it's just going to continue to evolve. As I'm seeing front office executives hired, a lot of them are coming from some of the major shoe companies like Nike, Nike from that are former reps mm -hmm. that are now being hired in player engagement. Very much so. Just because it's the relationship, the communication, the dialogue with the athlete, yes. and also understanding them. And the landscape, right? Because right. Because obviously this business has changed tremendously over the last five years, as I'm sure it has 10, and if you look 15 and 20 back. Mm -hmm. So you are looking like, you know, for example, uh, an example that pops out into my is like a Marquise Watts over in Minnesota who mm -hmm. has a, you know a background with an agency and or then a shoe company right. and I remember reading obviously because of interest at that 
that is strictly due to the relationship bit and being able to translate that into business objectives right. and such. Correct. Okay, okay. I love that. So, okay, so let's go back to, to your representation. So, obviously, you represent a player that we're very familiar with here at Afro Balls in Pascal Siakam. Everyone is enthralled by his inspiring story, um, and he's inspired not only players in Africa but all over the world um, because of, you know, the inception, the work ethic, and, of course, most importantly, the results, you know? Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about that story of, of how you, and you talked a little bit about courting a player at their inception versus, you know, uh, into their career. Tell us about that story and about, you know, what really said that to, to Pascal, and that somebody who you've shepherded and guided, and, you know, I wouldn't say, I w it's a success story in a way, you know what I mean? But walk us a little bit through that journey. Well, it's a long story, so I'm going <laughs> so to try to... It's so truncated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Certainly. I won't, I won't keep us here all day. Yeah. It's, it was interesting, kind of looking back in hindsight. It was uh, December 2015. I received a text from a college coach that was a friend of mine that was playing or coaching in the same conference at Pascal. And for, for those of you that don't know, you know, Pascal played at a smaller mid-major. Yes. Uh, he played at, Las, at New Mexico State in La, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So a lot of scouts and a lot of people did not want to travel to Las Cruces because of the small market, right? There was nothing that really brought them there. But if you looked at uh, Pascal's stats at the time, mm -hmm. they were extremely impressive. So I get a text from the coach. Maybe about two weeks later, I'm seeing Pascal play in Bakersfield. Simultaneously, my colleague happened to represent his older brother. But there's a lot, some people will say, well, how did you not know? You know, the dynamics of Pascal's family and when he left Cameroon, as well as his brothers, they hadn't seen each other in years. So, so even his older brother, who was then at Vanderbilt, didn't know to the extent of how good his little brother had gotten and how much he had grown. So when I went to Bakersfield, I saw Pascal. I was able to confirm some things, even come to my own judgment about his talent. And, um, you know, when you're prospecting or evaluating talent, at least for me, it's not only seeing where they are now today, it's also having a vision for what they could be, in the, they could be in the future. Certainly. A lot of that is contingent on not just the physical attributes of the player, but it's also getting to know them and seeing their personality, their work ethic, their work habits, you know, their processing speeds in terms of basketball IQ. Um, and then putting the, assembling the right team of resources around them. And for Pascal, you know, seeing his talent, fast forward, he's now officially signed. He's in the gym in L.A. He's with a good friend of mine who was a teammate, Rico Hines at the time, who's now with uh, the 76ers uh, as an assistant coach. You know, Pascal just came in there and just literally elevated everyone's talent day one. And you could see that he had the potential to be an all-star, all-NBA level player, future Hall of Famer. It is incredible, um, you know, again, just knowing his journey um, from Cameroon mm -hmm. um, to a mid-major. Let's talk about that. Let's dive into that for a second. You know, we're seeing jumps of players from the continent to now D1 programs, yeah. and, you know, being highly sought after recruits. Speak to the importance of this, these mid-major markets and smaller schools. And essentially, you know, that's where you found a diamond in the rough, so to right. speak. So, you know, if there's somebody watching on the continent and they have an offer that may not seem lucrative because they are in Omaha or insert yeah. other mid-major market school or NEIA or whatever conference school, um, can you speak to the importance of that still being a, a, a resource and a way, a gateway into the league? Yeah, it, I guess it starts with my background as well, is I'm first generation American. My, my parents are immigrants to the U.S. So having an understanding of what it is to be an immigrant in America um, is important in terms of representing international talent, whether they be from Africa or Europe or anywhere else outside of the U.S. And what I mean by that is like going back to your question, Ivy, about schools it's all about fit and it's not just colleges even in the nba it's you know no different than we're talking about individuals and nba teams understanding athletes nba athletes you need to have a component of of coaches on the staff uh management or even at the collegiate level people that are going to understand 
international customs. The dynamic from which they come from. A hundred percent. The circumstances that they may face. Yeah, because there is a there is a difference in terms of, and I say this, it's just different culturally, there's a different dynamic or understanding as it relates to authoritative figures. A coach is an authoritative figure. Mm. So if you're coming from the continent, how you're viewing your coach is almost, especially with you leaving your family behind, that is now your family Very dynamic. Very similar to our guardian. You know Correct. I mean? Right. So if that coach isn't a good fit, what, what effect it then has is impacting the player's confidence. If you lose confidence, regardless of talent at this level, you're not going to find success, whether it be in college or even at the pro level. So that's something for me when I'm, when I'm working with our international clients it's it, it not just Pascal. Pascal's a case study. Say Thierry Darlin, right? Um, for Thierry, it's having that experience with Pascal and really getting to know him. What are the family dynamics? Uh, was there anything traumatic that happened recently for them as a teenager being away from their family? How can I be empathetic towards that and understand what may be happening and then find a situation that's I, I, I don't want to, I hate to use the word nurturing, but it's going to be nurturing. But it's very confidence. much so because yeah. that's essentially what development then turns into be. And once you develop the person, then you can fully tap yeah. into their potential. Especially as they're moving. I think a lot of people lose sight of these young athletes are still young. They're still young men and young women. They're not even in their adulthood. So if they're not in that environment to support them in this integral part of their life, right, independent of sport, right. then they could falter and they're not going to find or maximize the success. 1,000 points. It's the equivalent of skipping a very integral developmental stage, you know, as a child into whatever have you. And so exactly. it is important to create very much like a house, a great foundation. You Correct. know, I love that. So listen, let's talk about, you know, a different player that you represent and now a teammate of Pascal and Andrew Nambard, who is doing really well with Team Canada um, and the Pacers, who you are uh, here to watch. What does it mean? We've talked about that nurturing and that familial, you know, uh, relationship. What does it mean to you um, and your players to not only be here to watch them play? What do these gestures mean for the long term? You know what I mean? Um, nurturing of a relationship. I think it's I think, you know, I can't speak for my my clients or the athletes, but, you know, oftentimes I'll have family there supporting them. Yeah, I think to have their representation uh, there to support them or be in an environment is sharing in experiences mm -hmm. outside of just, you know, the fact that, you know, a lot of the executives will be here from the NBA. There's deals to be made. <laughs> Correct. But just being there to have the, the experience and the support, I think goes a long way for an athlete. It, for me as a former athlete, yeah. it would mean a lot for me to see my advisors being there just supporting when they could be doing so many other things so many other things so that's that's what i think it leads to and it's not just the now it's you know you take uh you know a number of different experiences that you share with your client yes even the eastern conference finals run that they had yes and the dinners afterwards or the conversations or understanding where the athlete has come from like after, uh, Andrew in particular, it was, it was challenging at the beginning of the season. So now to see him find the success, be in the Eastern Conference Finals, have individual and team success, then get a contract. Now he's here playing in the quarterfinals. If you're not there every step of the way to have those conversations, yeah. not just when times are good and at this stage, yeah. but also when no one's paying attention and seeing what they may be going to, yeah. then you're not building that trust or that that genuine relationship. That's true. And they say, you know, almost from a, you know, again, back to the character, it's like you really get to know somebody not only at their peaks, but at their valleys. Yeah. Not only, get, not only do you get to know them, but then you get to be there for them as well. Which We'll also you know, say this business, as much as it's business, it's personal. Personal. It's a very, it's not, I don't want to be transactional. Oftentimes you hear the term agent, you think transaction. Mm -hmm. I think for me or for even uh, my agency is we're managers that know how to be very good at the transaction, but any way that we can influence the transaction in the future to get to the outcomes we want, that's what we want to do. Which I think speaks volumes to the name of your, your your agency, you know, life sports and media entertainment. So it's it's life. The emphasis is, is life, right? It's not necessarily life first. Life is a precursor. 
right. then the other business ventures, you know, then come there after. Well, any, any way you want to put it, life is basketball or basketball it's is life. life. Right. It's life. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. So listen, you also represent, you know, a lot of NBA players, but future stars that, you know, play in Europe. And how difficult is that for you since these leagues and countries all have different regulations when it comes to representation and such? How do you manage it all, right? Are there times where, you know, there are conflicts or is it pretty much, you know, uh, how, yeah, how do, you, how do you navigate that space? I wouldn't say there's conflicts. Yeah. Uh, conflicts, if there are any potential conflicts, you mitigate them you avoid. <laughs> in, in advance, right? Right, right. But I give a lot of credit to my, I call them my teammates, the people I work with. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant, you know, uh, very well educated, you know, having tremendous work experience. You know, managing that, it's not all on me. I'm one person that can only be in one time zone at any particular time. So mm -hmm. I give it up to the people I work with that, you know, may be based in Europe. My international office is in Limassol, Cyprus. So them managing, because of them being in the time zone, mm -hmm. them also being European but educated in the U.S., mm -hmm. They're able to, na you know, manage, you know, our clients in Europe, Australia, in Asia, yeah. in those top markets. Yeah. And then on the on the North American side, you know, you know, uh, Mike Simonetta, who's out of Toronto, Jafar Shafani, who's out of Orlando, and then of course me on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and then the rest. Of Alex Tarsis, our marketing exec in Chicago, mm -hmm. we have all the different time zones or regions covered, bases covered. on the continent. Right. And then uh, even Dominique Dotson, who we brought on, um, who I brought on in, in client relations, mm -hmm. her background in basketball, mm -hmm. her. Um, uh, masters in sports management mm -hmm. like everyone has their individual talent yeah. that is then able to support our clients in different ways they're neat they're back to your point they're experts in their space they're experts in their niches but nonetheless you put them all together and you have a, a gladiator team exactly. <laughs> I love that so now look you again um, experience a great number of successes far what are your hopes um for the next couple of years um and you know you're here at the olympics this is obviously a great scouting ground so to speak to, to kind of see the future from all over the globe uh what is what is your global expansion plan possibly look like or what you know what's what's next on well, your, your to I conquer list i can't give all my trade secrets <laughs> am i uh, asking a lot <laughs> no no you, you might be asking a lot it's a matter of whether i'm gonna what you're gonna give it a you ask not but, have uh, not right <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes it's uh it's one of those things it's a great question i think the landscape you mentioned it earlier the business changes every five years but i don't think in my 25 years that I've seen the industry change as much as it has in the last five years. And that's everything from NIL um, to this uh, new CBA and the NBA, new media rights deal, uh, NBA talking about expansion, obviously Seattle and Vegas, and then just the world getting smaller. You know, what's changed at these Olympics is it's become a lot more competitive. There, you know, these, uh, you know, other national teams are not intimidated by just a team walking in with Team USA well, certainly on because the jersey. The national teams are what is it, over 160 something odd players who, uh, in the Olympics that are NBA players, you know. So it's not right. like you're walking into back to the dream team. It's like now you're walking into your teammates. Well, you know what I mean? and they're, they're they're your peers in the NBA. Yeah. But they've been practicing and playing together since they're been kids with their national team. <laughs> exactly with their national team. Right. Right. So. You know, you take you take all of those, uh, you know, all of that dynamic or um, all of those factors. And now the world is that much more competitive. Mm -hmm. And you see that reflected in the NBA in terms of the demographic yeah. of international players. Oh, right. So for me, in terms of global expansion, it's it's uh, now that we're seeing NIL, NIL in some ways is is acting like international teams. So your international players that once stayed in Europe mm -hmm. because of the compensation, the player development mm -hmm. are now looking at the NCAA because the compensation of NIL is greater than their contracts in Europe. But Todd, let's talk about that. So mm -hmm. right now we, there is a litigation in process and unless something has changed within the last couple of weeks, which I've been following NIL mm -hmm. deals for international students, um, are they are not necessarily allowed yet to be compensated through NIL deals because of the F-1 visa structure. Right? Correct. How long do you think we're going to be parked at this at this intersection of not allowing that to happen? Because I've, Not very long. Not very long. I mean, we, we could go down that path. Um, 
in terms of where I think the NCAA is going or yeah. where all, and you're seeing it with the college football playoffs already. It's happening in basketball. It's just a matter of time yeah. before in some ways, maybe it becomes privatized, um, you know, and there's this element of now the amateurism is starting to move away or move towards professionalism, professionalism essentially. in terms of the NIL and it, look, even the university's ability to compensate the athletes now, 100%. which is moving towards. So those are all the things that I'm looking at, yeah. uh, but also staying focused in terms of I am in the business or my company is in business in representing the most talented players uh, in basketball, mm -hmm. right? Or professional sports mm -hmm. in the future, mm -hmm. outside of basketball, mm -hmm. men and women. Mm -hmm. And so anything we do in the NIL space mm -hmm. is still going to have that in mind in terms of us representing athletes mm -hmm. that have the opportunity to play as professionals, whether it be in uh, the U.S. or, or international wonderful. in the best markets. Got it, got it. So we shared a moment earlier. You're obviously a very, very proud girl dad. Um, and the women's sports space uh, obviously is across the board, mm -hmm. basketball, soccer, wherever have you, the interest in the growth and development of women's sports is booming at an unprecedented rate. Um, and it's something that we love to see. So is this necessarily going to, for you, uh, result in the increase of representation or the increase in representation of female athletes or uh, where is your focus there? Yeah, it's one of those things. And I love to see the growth in the game because it's, it's been a beautiful game even before, let's just say, the Caitlin Clark effect. Yes. Um, so now that the resources are being poured into women's sports, and not just the resources in terms of financial, but even the media attention that it's garnering and seeing it become more visible, I think is phenomenal. Yeah. For me, it's always about being, you know, from a business plan standpoint, being able to service our clients, whether they're, they're men or, or women. women. Mm -hmm. So there is an initiative in the future to represent women's sports. But again, it comes back to me identifying the right person that could lead that division. Mm -hmm. That's a reflection of me or a reflection of the ethos of the company. right. Exactly. Right. Because I always, I, I say it internally to staff all the time, like we're all a, each a reflection of each other. Thousand percent. So that person needs to execute at a very high level yeah. with my support, yeah. but them even leading that initiative. So. It's true to what you said. That's family, right? Mama exactly. always said, don't go out there acting crazy because they're going to think that's what, that's what happens in our household. So, exactly. you know what I mean? I love that ethos. Mm -hmm. Now, look, we know that you are American. We know that you represent athletes from all over the world. Mm -hmm. What do you think will? Uh, what do you think these finals are going to look like? These Olympic finals, man. Any predictions? You know, I, I right now I'd say that probably the three strongest teams is Team USA, Team Canada, and Germany. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's. I mean, it's single elimination. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah. Obviously, Team Canada tonight is playing France. I was going to say we you got know, some uh, home court advantage. Yes. But I, I'd like to think that Team Canada is going to edge France. Yes. As talented as they are, yes. and then of course you have Germany in the bracket with Canada, and then U.S. on the other US side. On the so side. Yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. I don't know about you all, but I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, you know what? Before we do sign off, though, I do have one last question, mm -hmm. because as someone who has existed in the basketball ecosystem from my childhood until now mm -hmm. um, and understanding that the opportunities to serve in this space look way greater than just playing and or uh, the staff on the bench. What would be some encouraging words that you have to a young, you know, child, someone um, on the continent watching who is interested in pursuing a career at the intersection of business and sports um, and just speak to, you know, um, how to strengthen that, how to get that experience mm -hmm. um, and, and, and encourage it. Because I personally think that as the infrastructure grows and the infrastructure being sporting teams and the players, that there should be considerate attention placed on educating youth to be able to serve in auxiliary roles such as um, agencies, agents, marketing roles, and all the business roles that we know, the behind the scenes GMs or whatever right. have you. So can you just speak to, you know, your um, your thoughts on that, but also kind of where, where do they start? Where would one start? I think his first starts are great mentorship. Mm -hmm. You have to find a great mentor that's in the industry that has a good reputation, a strong reputation, experience that could help guide you. That's the first thing. The other thing is just being open to opportunities in the business of sports. 
I know when I got into it, my vision is tunnel vision of being an agent. I'm going there. <laughs> I'm going there. Yeah, but yeah. As you, as you get older and more experienced, you're like, oh, wow, team yeah. council. That's interesting. Or general manager or team president or league office. There's so many, or even on the executive, uh, or excuse me, on the shoe side as an executive. Mm -hmm. There's so many different opportunities in some ways that are no different than being an, uh, being an agent mm -hmm. that I think young people should keep their, uh, you know, eyes open eyes to. Eyes open, right. Uh, the other thing is continue to, no different than an athlete, work on your game. Educate yourself. We know the stakes are getting higher in terms of the contracts of the athletes. They're getting more sophisticated. I encourage all of uh, young people to go to grad school or have a, a specialized focus in terms of their educational background, um, you know, that could benefit not only them, but benefit some of the athletes um, or even the job that they're in in the future. Now, is that gonna, going to be everyone's path? No. But when you look at even those that haven't f gone to grad school, uh, or in some cases haven't finished college, that's fine. They still have support staff that do have those advanced degrees. 100%. So in no different than it is highly competitive for the professional athletes at this level of the NBA, or even Olympic athletes, it's ex it probably even more competitive on, on the, the other business side, side of things, yes. for everyone trying to compete for okay. those positions 1, in sports. So if you don't create that competitive edge yeah. or sharpen your skills right. and then have that represented on your resume right. in terms of either your work experience or educational background, right. and now it's an uphill battle, right? right. right? Right. But I would tell them to be persistent, too. It's it's not an easy business to break into. Highly sought after, very sexy, but very very yeah. demanding at the and, same time. And no one sees everything. You know, I've, it's like it, we talked about the yeah. schedule before we yeah. started the interview. Yeah. It's it's a grueling, grueling. schedule. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. and you have to be on point yeah. when you land or touch down in a different time they zone. Show up and show out. Show up and show out. Right. Yep. I love that. I think this has been a great lesson for me, and I hope mm -hmm. for you all as well. In a lot of things, in mentorship, in having a vision, in working hard, in ethic, in the value of education, because you practice how you play, education is something that's continual. So whether it begins with a degree, it has mm -hmm. to continue and it has to sustain as an industry. You have to be a lover of your craft. You have to be into it. It's got to be your blood, bread, water, what you eat, sweat, breathe, the mm -hmm. like. So. Thank you for sharing your insight. Thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing you around. Um, and thank you for being a part of the Afro Ballers family as well, too. Oh, now. thank you for having me. You know me what I mean? No, this has been great. Certified, certified. Especially on this platform, like I said, here in Paris. Yes, this here in incredible. Paris. Yes, and thank you once again to FIBA for having us here at the FIBA House. Todd Ramosar, ladies and gentlemen, make sure to keep in touch. Now, if anybody wants to keep in touch with the agency, how can they reach you um, on social media? You know, they could find, find me on social media, on Instagram. Okay. at T Ramasar or the agency that could follow at Life Sports Agency or even my uh, they'll find me on LinkedIn. Love it. Thank you so much, Todd.